you been enjoying our series on Jonah? Yes, Jonah went to new depths. Uh, the whale helped, I'm sure. Had a whale of a time down there and experienced a new depth. And I know some parts of Jonah might be hard to swallow. The whale found that out too. And uh, that's probably why he brought him up. So I'm glad I brought that up, right? But, <laughs> but there's so many things we can learn from Jonah. And uh, today, is we're going to close, it's going to be the, the conclusion. That's what we do when we close. We get to conclusion. And so today, we're going to be concluding the story of Jonah. And uh, I'm sure you've all enjoyed Pastor Darling's renditions of how Jonah in the first couple of chapters went. Um, the screen might have to play for me again. It's got my change when changing. But I, I want to ask you, if you have your Bibles with you, just uh, head over to Jonah chapter 4. And we're going to pick up where Pastor Carol left. And in the first little introductions that we've had, we understand that Jonah was written about 3,000 odd years ago. I know 3,000 is an even number, so 3,001 odd years ago, uh, around about there. And we must also understand that this book was written by Jonah. And so when you read the story, you kind of think, Jonah, what's wrong with you, man? You know, you think that someone's writing to just show you how crazy Jonah was, how angry Jonah got, how Jonah missed God, how Jonah wouldn't listen to God, how Jonah ran away from God, and, and so many things that if we wrote about someone else, we'd probably point all of that out. But he wrote this about himself. <laughs> and when you write an autobiography that you want everyone else to read, don't you think you're going to write it to make yourself look good? This is my autobiography. I look amazing. There are a whole lot of things I've left out. They will be published after I die. You know, it's a question, idiot. But Jonah doesn't clean up his book because it's your story in Jonah. He wants to show us what we are like sometimes with God in our unrenewed thinking. If Jonah had not repented and changed the way he thought after everything that he went through, he wouldn't have written a book like he wrote. He also wanted to show Israel that God's dealings with Nineveh and with Jonah mimic God's dealings with Israel. And it was almost like, Israel, open your eyes to see what's going on here. But 3,001 odd years later, God is saying to you, in what ways are you like Jonah? In what ways do you also have faulty belief systems and patterns that make you sometimes want to run away from God. And so Carol started out, and the summary from the first message that she gave is that because God is merciful and faithful, he will watch over his word to you in order for you to fulfill your call. Amen? And then we saw the second week that God is with me. And we define success not by getting it right first time or every time, but by the fact that God is with me, and that means every failure that we calibrated and I learned from can take me closer to the prize of living joyfully in the midst of failure. Share the example of Edison making light bulbs. How many of you remember Edison making light bulbs? So he was like, oh, hey, Edison. But he was the guy who invented the light bulb, and we're all very grateful today, aren't we? That after a thousand missed attempts, he didn't say, I failed a thousand times. He said, I have learned a thousand ways to not fall in love. And so God is teaching Jonah some things. And when we make mistakes and learn from them, then they are not failures. Right? Sometimes God just needs to change the way we think. And in chapter 4, we see God really challenging Jonah in some of the ways that he thinks. And Jonah chapter 4 portrays a pouting prophet practicing pride and prejudice pursued by a gracious and good God. Amen. Right? And so, you know, uh, I, I know it's a pouting prophet, and not all of you consider yourselves prophets, but I think we can all see ourselves in this particular story today. So this passage portrays possibly what pouting people might be like if we practice in pride and prejudice pursued by a gracious and good God. God is always good. But if we don't change the way we think about God and our expectations of Him, we are sometimes tempted to think God's not being good to me. I know 
none of you have ever thought that, right? So let's look at Jonah. We, we see that in Jonah chapter 3, he preaches to the Ninevites, he declares the message of God as a great evangelist, and what happens? The Ninevites all repent from the king down. He takes his royal robes off, they get in sackcloth and ashes, they humble themselves, that's how they showed humility and repentance in those days. And they humbled themselves before this God that they didn't even know. Jonah was introducing to them a God that they didn't serve. They served other gods, but they feared this God and thought maybe he will relent. When God saw they humbled themselves, what did he do? He saw that they repented, so he relented. Isn't that great? And we see a huge celebration in heaven over 120,000 people who all turned away from their sin and their sinful ways and their ignorance of God, turned to God, and saw his mercy being displayed on a nation that should have been judged when God's wrath poured out on them. Isn't that great? The Bible says that there's a huge celebration in heaven whenever a single sinner comes to repentance. Imagine how big it is when 120,000 of them do it in a day. Well, it took him three days to get through the city, the big city. So, 120,000 in three days, that's pretty good going. I mean, if we ran a mission into some town with 120,000 people, and they all repented, and they all got right with God, would you not go, whoa, you deserve the Evangelist Emmy Award? <laughs> there is such a thing. You could probably invent one. And so John is so happy, his mission is successful. Man, I want to preach, they all got saved. And so we pick it up in Jonah chapter 4, where Jonah is so incredibly happy about this. When God saw that he did not smite them, wipe them out, fall down, fire and brimstone from heaven, if this pleased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. The Hebrew kind of implies that it could have been translated, he was angry with exceeding anger. <laughs> we'll see what that looks like in a moment. So he's now seriously angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, you see, God, this is why I ran away from you. <laughs> kind of a summary of what he said. Why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful. Slow to anger. I knew that you were a good God. You were bound in steadfast love. You were led from disaster. That's why I ran away from you. Does that make sense? Right? He's so mad that God's a good God. That's very interesting and so bad that he says, Let one now, O Lord, take my life for me. It is better for me to die than to live. Just kill me. What a response. You're good, you're a gracious, you're a merciful God. Now, in hindsight, we look back and we kind of like, that was a really crazy response. But you see, Jonah had grown up as an Israelite, and the Israelites saw themselves as God's chosen people and the rest he damned. And so they were like, anyone who's an enemy of Israel gets smitten. And Assyria was enemy of Israel to such an extent that they had already been prophesying that Assyria was going to come and take Israel captive because of Israel's sins. How many of you have read Kings and Chronicles and recognized there were just a few generations of righteous kings? It didn't last long as good. <laughs> Saul blew it. David really took it to a new level. I think all of David and Solomon's wives helped to bring it down a notch or two. And then, you know, after that, it's just like idolatry, Baal worship. If I were God, I would have smitten by the Israelites long ago. Give me three chapters of watching what they did, God did, and I would have gone, I warned you, lightning bolts, thunder, because God is a gracious, merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in love. How many times? Did Jonah know that God had given Israel a predetermined nation multiplied by the power of ten to eternity? And if you don't know what that number looks like, ask my son David. He works with those numbers all the time. Isn't that right, Dave? I mean, that's a big number. <laughs> God will just keep going. But Jonah hated the Ninevites. Jonah wanted God to wipe them out. So when God has mercy on them and they get saved, he says, Now, friends, I know we look at that and go, oh, Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. But how many 
terms of being, being wounded only by someone. How many of you have some enemies? I know none of you have. I don't want to show of hands. Just can I see a raise of your large left toe? That's more than I thought. Wow. You see, when you have someone that you are really mad at, I don't know, maybe uh, I had uh, a bully in school. I, I was a bully most of the time myself, so I just guess I lived there. So but now you got a bully in school. You go to your dad and it's like, Dad, I want you to beat up that bully. That bully hurts me. Dad says, I can fix my son. Sit down with the bully. Comes back and says, You would be glad to know you won't be bullying me again. Yeah. What did you do, Dad? Well, I just went to him and found out how terrible his home environment is, how much pain he's in. He's growing up under abuse the whole time. And I shifted from home to home. I played with him. He got saved. What? <laughs> you were supposed to beat him up! Some of you have an abusive boss, and there are times that you would like God to crucify <laughs> certain people. And the Lord says to him, Do you do well to be angry? I think God says that to some, us sometimes. Jonah doesn't even answer. He just like salt, and he storms out of the city. Now, why does he storm out of the city? He storms out of the city because. He goes and makes a boot for himself. Now, this is the desert in Iran, what is modern day Iran. I mean, I know a lot of you have been to the desert in Iran, like the common tourist destination in South Africa. And, and when you get there, there are not a whole lot of plants and trees and shade and all of this. And so the city has been designed in such a way to protect you from the heat and the scorching winds and the desert storms. And so when, when he leaves the city, he knows that he's leaving protection. However, he's leaving the protection of the city to go and make a boot out there because he doesn't want the city to be protected. He wants God to signify that. And he thinks, even though God relented, I know God relented in the end of chapter 3, but maybe in chapter 4, God will signify that still. So I'm going to get out of the city and watch and go, God, I think you should storm this further. And he's sitting and watching, I want that to be signified. Because you know, some of this is different. That's just how they see it in the media. You know what it means. And so he's sitting there and he's all mad. And what ends up happening is God appoints a plant. And he makes the plant come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his bald head. I just say that because I can relate. <laughs> Save him from discomfort. Jonah was exceedingly glad he took the plant. Now that's the same word used for him being exceedingly angry. So he went from exceedingly angry exceedingly glad. And how many of us do this flip flop a whole lot of times with God? God, you're so good. You gave me this new job. You're such an amazing God. You want some bread. Oh, but my boss is ah, and he's abusive and he's angry and I don't like him. God, you're not good. Why would you put me in this environment? Oh, God. You know that sometimes God puts us in God unsaved environments because he wants you to be salt and light. You know, if he had to put you in just this wonderful kitchen company where it's just like heaven, then what about all the dark places? The only way he reaches the dark places is by sending some of us there. And so when you pray for a job, you must understand God appointed Jonah to go and do this part. And when Jonah said no, God didn't say, well, I disappoint you. Jonah, you've disappointed me, I disappoint you. I unappoint you. No, you see, God has created you in such a way that he has an appointment for every one of you. The Bible says God prepared in advance good works for every one of us to do in Christ Jesus. So you must understand that God created you in his mind with a purpose that only you can really fulfill better than others around you. When we compare ourselves to others, we feel like we're not doing well enough because they got a different purpose. So you find what you were appointed to. And some people might be appointed to high positions and some are appointed to low positions. But our appointment on this side of heaven is to reach the world, not to have a comfortable, happy, wonderful existence. 
this side of heaven, you can prove it yourself. Jesus promised this. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. We were tempted. Can you say that without spitting on the face of Rabbi? Yes. Okay, now you know a little Greek. As I said, also a little Greek. It's done work for you with the French pronunciation. But it means persecution, trials, tribulation, pressure. Why does God take us through these things? So that we can fulfill our appointment and everything that challenges that can get checked up. When you go through the fire, only that which is not of Jesus gets burnt. And so while he's working here with Jonah, he sends this plant, and Jonah thinks God has finally seen what a great person I am and what I deserve. Thank you, God. How many times do we flip flop between when God's good, then my life is good, and somehow when my life's not so good, God's not good? Mm -hmm. Or in the back of my mind, I think it's good, God, but it's not good for me. And I don't know if you've ever thought that, but it's a common lie of the enemy. Because the only way we change this is to change the way we think about God and His way. Go get this. So Jonah's very really happy about the plant, but the next day, God appoints a worm. So notice this word appoint, it appears all the way through. God appointed Jonah. Jonah runs from his appointment. God appoints a storm. Jonah can't run anymore because the storm stops them from going to Tarshish. He gets appointed to be thrown into the waves and drown. However, God appoints a fish, a very large fish, one that I have never caught or seen, probably. He swallows Jonah. God appoints that fish. Now, as I mentioned, part of Jonah is hard to swallow, and the fish caught him up. And he appoints the place that the fish should bring him up, right there. Oh, I'm safe. Oh, where, what is this place? Sorry, excuse me. What is this place? It's Nineveh. Oh, how's that for a coincidence? <laughs> okay, I've been in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. I happened to repent while I was there. But has he really repented? You see, sometimes when things are so tough and so dark, and you are stuck on the side of the highway, your car's broken down. Now I'm crying out to God. God, I'm so sorry. I, I, I was angry at the day. I slipped aside and missed of you. Because, you know, sometimes our situations make us cry out to God. And there's, there's what is called worldly sorrow as opposed to godly sorrow, which Jonah cried out because we see that he didn't actually get it. So God sends and appoints the fish. Then God, in this situation, appoints a plant. And then God, to teach him an object lesson, appoints a worm. And the worm eats the plant. And that's one very big worm. Usually we more than one. And so when God comes up the next day, God appoints the worm, catches the plant, and eats it. When the sun rose, God appointed again a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might. Better for me to die than to live. We look at Jonah and say, Why why live, man? And how many of you have kind of like, God, I don't know why would you let that happen? I just want to die. I go, we, we sometimes just like Jonah. I don't know about you, but I think you might know some people who like that. God says to Jonah, Jonah. Do you do well to be angry for the plot? Now remember he asked him before, do you do well to be angry because I saved Nineveh? And now Jonah responds, he says, yes. I do well to be angry, angry enough to... Oh. We had this guy on suicide watch, you know? <laughs> this, this guy needs some antidepressants or something, you know? He needs Jesus. And the Lord said to him, you pity this plot for which you did not labor, labor, or did you make it grow? It came into being in a night, it perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left? Now, in biblical speak, that is talking about the fact that they did not know what was morally required of them. They didn't understand who God was and what he required. The Jews knew their right hand from their left, not because they had a better education in school and learned left and right. But because they understood who God was, they'd been raised in his principles, 
And God is saying to Jonah, Jonah, you know me. You've known me from a child. You raised in an environment that teaches about me all the time. There's a nation who has no idea who I am. They just know me naturally. What they will be without me. And you care more about your past and about your future than you do about the future. I want to make two points in in time as we look at this conclusion. I want to look at two things that we learned from Jonah. The first is I want to touch on the danger of anger. Uh, sorry, the danger of anger. Uh, I know the English language is weird. The danger of anger. I got it. I got it. And that's why we have wives up front. We tell us how this line is going to Now, listen. When we when we talk about anger, I think we saw an angry man portrayed in Jonah 4. Would you agree? He is super mad. Who's he mad at? He's mad at God. Now we know he's probably mad at the Ninevites as well. By the tent when they get the tent, and the crack between the tree. But he's pretty mad at God. Well, you know, here's the thing, is that when we have expectations of God that he doesn't keep, it's not that our anger is going to change the way God behaves. God is not. Have you ever read a scripture that says, God does not change. Now that doesn't mean he doesn't change his mind, he doesn't work with us, but his plans and purposes, he knows what he's got. He knows the appointment. He'll just keep working in Jonah over and over and over until Jonah gets it. Why? Because he's not just preparing a word, he's not just appointing a fish or preparing the plant or preparing a worm, he's preparing a person. He's preparing Jonah to be a better person. And we know that something shifted in Jonah because he wrote this book to say, this is how we should do it. But when we, when we put a sermon together, I believe research is critical. I spent a lot of time researching uh, Jonah, and when they discovered some of the latest manuscript evidence in one of the old caves, they discovered some archives from Nineveh. And I, I love the fact that uh, I, I managed to find this. Um, they have a picture of what Jonah looked like towards the end of chapter 4, just before he headed back to Israel. And uh, please don't take pictures of this copyright by Nineveh Studios. Um, but I, I want you to see some things about Anya. Because Jonah, well, he was angry with exceedingly great Anya. That's what it looks like. You want to know what Anya looks like? Oh, it's look. Some of the red hair, the black hair, the green in Iran, where an ate my plant, you know, kind of dog ate my homework kind of thing. But he is angry. He's angry at God. In the back of our minds, we know that God is a good God, right? But when we go through stuff, even though that's in the back of our minds, we still find ourselves thinking that God will deal with us and make our lives comfortable and good because he's a good God. And when he doesn't, anger at God is a result. And he is so angry with God, but I don't know if you logically can agree with me that getting angry at God is fairly futile. I don't believe God minds you having it out with him. Seriously. I think God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. And for you to say, God, I've actually been very mad by this. I don't understand why you get mad at this. I want to understand. Help me to see the way you see it. That's, he doesn't mind us having those conversations. But when we allow the anger to spill out in such a way that it destroys our relationship with him and our relationship with other people, that is destructive anger. And I don't know, but uh, you know, the more I get angry at God, and I've done it a few times, I'm sorry, I know I should, uh, I'm a pastor, yes. Yes, I've gone and got mad at God before, but it never makes me right, and it never changes who God is, and his purpose for me. And so it's kind of like the proverbial banging my head against the brick wall. It's like, why are you doing banging your head against the brick wall? Oh, oh, that's what I'm going to do. Let's do it. Now it's coming. And all you end up doing is cleaning, damaging the wall. You may have to repaint the thing. It's a lose lose situation. So when we get angry, there are a few things that happen, but they have discovered some health, in fact, 
The impact goes physically. Now I'm talking about anger and destructive anger, right? There is a, a righteous anger. The people who live angry and give in to anger often battle with headaches, digestive problems, abdominal pain, insomnia. How many of you can sleep well when you're angry? <laughs> It doesn't work that way. I believe the enemy will try to trigger you to be angry in so many situations to short circuit and to get you to pull out of what God told us and what He said to you and you miss out on the best that He said to you. Increased anxiety, depression. Mm -hmm. These are things people who give in to anger regularly experience in their lives. High blood pressure. Skin problems such as eczema, heart problems including heart attacks, strokes, and I added the last one that's not scientifically proven, but I think it's accurate. <laughs> Makes you look ugly. How many angry people when someone's like really giving you a go? And arr, 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 so they look very physical. It's like, oh, you know, I like that look from you. Okay, cool, man. All right, what you done? Bible has a whole lot to say about anger. Let me just say this. There is a righteous anger and there's an unrighteous anger. There can be constructive anger and there's destructive anger. Jesus got angry when they were trying to turn the temple into a marketplace, right? He overturned the tables. Righteous anger because he said, that is my father's house. It's going to be a house of prayer. Something to be a marketplace. And his anger rose up righteously. We should get righteously angry when someone tries to abuse the weak and the poor. We should get angry when women and children are mistreated because they're not as strong. We should get angry at what poverty is doing in destroying people's lives. We should get angry when someone comes to try to hurt ourselves or people we love. I want to tell you, someone comes into my house trying to hurt my wife, and even if they go there and try to call them, I'm going to get angry and probably violent. But we're not talking about that kind of anger right now, right? Most of us can relate to the fact that a lot of the anger we experience or angry people we know is destructive anger. And so when we talk about anger, Ephesians is a great verse to start with. Chapter 4, verse 2. It talks about us being taught with regard to our former way of life to put off the old self, which is corrupted by its deceitful desires. Deceitful desires. Would you say that with me? Deceitful desires. The old self is deceived into having desires that are contrary to God. How many of you know when you get saved, born again, the old self didn't just fall away? You didn't wake up the next morning going, I just feel like Jesus. I don't have any negative thoughts anymore. That old self, it's a process. So my spirit is renewed completely. I have been made a new creation in Christ because I have a new nature. But the old nature will still keep trying to deceive me. And what happens to us is that we have deceitful desires that lie to us that this desire is actually in God's will for me. God, I desire to be extremely wealthy. That must be your will for me. So that is my desire. And when I find myself having bills I can't pay, I get mad. I, God, I desire to have a really comfortable existence, never have any problems. I want a car that will never break down. I want a boss that is so nice to me that I just can't wait to get to work. I, I want to study uh, without having to do too much work and just get A's all the time. These are my desires, God, in Jesus' name, would you make them happen? And then when he doesn't, we get mad. But we don't get angry because God makes us. Or God is wrong. When we get angry, we must ask ourselves, what do I believe that's wrong? What is deceitful in me that is causing me to have different expectations to God? And the way I change is that I align my expectations to say, God, I choose to put my hope in you, not my hope in an outcome that I would prefer. Amen? And so when scripture talks about putting off our old self with deceitful desires, it says we must then be made new in the attitude of our mind, and it's really how we think that impacts everything. Anger is triggered by ways of thinking that are wrong. Talking about destructive anger right now. And then put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each 
of you must put a falsehood and speak truth to you to your name to your neighbor to keep you one body. And as one body, he then goes on and says the following recognizing your one body. So in your anger, recognize these things. It's their time to get angry. So don't let it be concerned. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the devil a football. Now there's quite a bit in scripture. We talk quite a bit of this actually in the apostolic chapter we just went through that that Carol was referring to. But anger is actually an open door for the enemy to operate in your life. When you get angry, you put yourself in a state that opens itself up to the lies of the enemy. And you start thinking about everything that's wrong and shut out everything that's right. And it works in a really incredible way. When he says, don't let the sun go down and on your anger, there's uh, some of the neuroscience of anger. Do you mind if I share a little bit of that with you? Uh, I, I love studying how neuroscience backs up the Bible. We've been doing a lot of inner healing ministry, etc., and part working with Pastor Jim. But what neuroscience is now showing about the brain just is confirming everything the Bible's always said. But the Bible, you know, not the Bible, the neuroscience, a recent article, talks about this. When you get angry and give into that anger, what ends up happening is a whole bunch of chemicals known, known as catecholamines. I don't think you need to know that. Released in you, causing a, an arousal of anger in you, in thinking that you might need to fight now. And so it prepares you to fight. But what ends up happening is that blood rushes up, blood pressure, your face may flush, I think we saw that in Jonah, and your body starts to release, if I give in to the anger, adrenaline and more adrenaline. What that does is it puts me in a mode where only one part of my brain can function, and it's the part of the brain that is the internal part of the blood. It shuts down the part of the brain that looks at solutions, that looks at self-control, that looks at why it's struggling. It shuts that part of the brain down. And so what ends up happening, I'll just read here the, the conclusion they came to. When angry, therefore, your attention narrows and becomes so locked onto the target of your anger that you can soon pay attention to nothing else because the brain can only think about that. So, when we become angry, it actually shuts out our ability to see anything good that God has given us. So this anger blinded him to see what God had just done in saving an entire city. Anger blinds you. But you know, next time you get angry, don't try and just suppress it. There are many ways to deal with anger. One of the things they talk about in anger is what they call it reappraisal. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. If you're not, don't worry. But reappraisal means changing the way you think about the situation. So let me give you an example. Your boss is shouting at you. Me and my son is screaming about you right now. And your boss is screaming and shouting at you. And we don't have a day. Have a day. Have a day. Let's do this to And and you you don't want to watch one of these speeches because then they get more angry, right? So you pay attention. You look at them and you just see what they they see. So you have a standing on them. So you look at them in the eye or probably something else. Just don't laugh while they do it. It makes them angry, right? You know, count the eyelashes. And in reappraisal, so what you do is you distract your mind to think about other things. Reappraisal says, oh, I'm supposed to be so much better. I'm so angry. I will not be so angry. I will teach you how to do that. And then you make a big problem, not mine, unless seriously you really messed up in the workplace and deserved a little bit of that. Then you do say, I'm really so sorry. I'm going to work this out, etc. But anger. When you experience an emotion, it releases chemicals, and those chemicals actually only last for 90 seconds. If you choose to take 90 seconds to just soak in the word, think about Jesus, think about the good things that he's doing to you, those chemicals dissipate. But the moment I give in to anger, more adrenaline, the adrenaline gets released, and they say it can take days for that to work out of your system. And for that entire time, you are more easily triggered. So people are regularly angry just because they're busy. Finding it harder and harder to control their anger. I know that's not you here. 
to listen to what the Bible has to say about how we should live. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so it will benefit those who listen. Wow. You can grieve the Holy Spirit through this. So if you're not going to grieve him, get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, fraud, slander, along with every form of hurt. James 1.19. Dear brothers and sisters, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Why? Because human anger does not produce the righteousness necessary. What about Colossians 3 8? But now rid yourselves with such things anger, rage, malice, slander, faulty language from your lips. Oh, we're getting the picture. Why faulty language? Can you talk with those instant anger makes you want to be or to God? And so when when ever stuff comes out of us that is not Jesus, we quickly just look inside and go, Ooh. Lord Jesus, I need a bit more of you in there. There's some things I need to fix. But also, what I'm speaking has created power. And when I cast a curse, that has created power over my environment and other people. And God wants us to grow. It's not good. Amen? Psalm 37 8. Refrain from anger, turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to. Be feeling like getting angry this week now. Yeah. <laughs> that word fret literally means to blaze or burn up with anger or joy. Charles Spurgeon, a famous uh, preacher and writer, said this Your friends, if like your man, you wish to complain, you will soon have many things to complain about. People who are resolved to fret about things will generally make for themselves many causes for fretfulness. You see, the attitude of your mind, like I began to look at Proverbs has some great things to say as well. A hot tempered person stirs up conflict, but one is patient, calms the quarrel. And then lastly, do not make friends with a hot tempered person and do not associate with one who easily angers. Spare yourself the trouble. If you work for one, you're going to have to work through that and trust God for a miracle. If you marry for one, you're both going to have to work through that and trust God for a miracle. But we don't have to associate with anger people. We're just like, I don't want to expose myself to that. And then I want to wrap up quickly by looking at the other one, which is going to be much quicker. We look at the danger of the danger of anger. I want to look at the problem with pride and prejudice. Why was Jonah so proud? Pride says, I don't need God, I know better. My plan, my political needs, trump God's. And they turn God's work in my life. By prejudice. Because if you thoroughly Israel deserved God and his mercy and his grace, and he rejected the other nations. And when Jonah is in trouble, he calls on God's mercy, right? I'm in the belly of this thing. My candle's gone out. I can't write anymore. Oh God, I'm crying out. And God has mercy on him. Every time Jonah cries out to God, every time Israel cries out to God, he has watched it. Mercy, mercy, mercy. But now, when it comes to seeing that mercy in the face of brothers, he is really terribly prejudiced. I hate those people, they're my enemy. How many of you got some people in your mind here? And they give you a bunch of opinions? Because Christians, just because we say it, doesn't mean you know, we, we immune to the opinion. His hatred, his bigotry against the Nehemiahs was seen in the first three chapters, but now it's really coming to the fore, right? You can see it like, because many Christians still carry the same kind of prejudice in their heart. Not we are we taught to hate, we taught not just to love one another, but Jesus said, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. That is our equivalent of go to Nineveh and preach for them to get saved. How easy is it to love your enemies? Some of you have been pretty hurt by people. People who have been abused growing up. And so easy. And I can tell you now that that anger and that hatred and that prejudice towards other people will only damage you. It is like drinking poison and expecting the other people to die. Is it going to be like God?
you want to carry some prejudice or the restriction that comes by this, as long as it shows, you know, who ought to believe that Israel was the chosen nation and that Jews were to be by for the Gentiles, you ought to get this vision from Jesus. And at the end, he says this, in truth I now know God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and lives righteously will be accepted by him. What prejudices do we carry when people are spoken to us? Or we're considered by enemies. God is doing something new when he's raising us up in the converted church to demonstrate relevance to different people of absolute different backgrounds. Ninevites and Israelites in the same church today being born for the glory of God. Crossing the cultural divides. And said God actually wants to be forgiving as an anger pride and prejudice in this world. You see, God is anger, pride, and prejudice blind and hate from sin and don't need to mercy and forgiveness. He can continue to receive and love you as an everlasting peace of God. Amen. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit, would you fall on us right now? Reveal to us areas of our hearts where we still have places of hatred, anger, pride, prejudice. Stuff we've carried, things that we've done to us. Places where we've been angry and hit others in our own anger. Holy Spirit, show us. Show us our blind spots right now. I want you to ask God, are there any restraining places that you feel restricted by? I'm going to ask you, kind of like the God of not their gifts, but there's, there's just something about doing the prophetic act. I want you to look into your soul and just see places where anger has operated, where pride has operated, where prejudice and hatred towards others has operated. Where there's pain, where you've been offended, where there might be bitterness or unforgiveness. And I just want to see in your soul those places. It's almost like you, this, this dark space where you've allowed that. I want you to picture putting your hand in your soul and just grabbing that darkness, that hatred, that anger, that prejudice, whatever it might be, and holding it in your hand in front of you and just looking at it, just getting it out of your soul. While you hold it in your hand, I want you to just picture Jesus next to you. Would you say to the Lord Jesus, I don't want this anymore. I give it to you. I ask you to come and put your hand on your cursed soul right now and replace that darkness that has operated. Replace those lies with your grace, your truth, your mercy, your love, your joy, your healing. Just picture him filling that place with light right now. Thank you. 